Good morning and welcome. Thank you all for coming out on this January morning. And Happy New Year to everybody. We're welcoming you back in a brand new year for MDCC and kicking off our, our tread talks for the season. Uh, my name is Doug Malone. I'm Director of Vehicle Operations and Curator here at the museum. And I uh, hope you enjoy our collection. And we always like feedback, so be sure to let us know if something you'd like to see that's not on the floor. And we'll do our best to try to work that in someday. But anyway, we are thrilled to have with us today Drew Casper. Drew was our museum's very first curator when we were getting formed. and did an amazing job collecting a beautiful collection. A lot of those cars are still out here in our collection floor. So Drew's responsible for really getting us off to a great start. And I had the honor of working with Drew for about a year and a half or so. Well, earlier than that on the, yeah. on the research team, I guess. But uh, anyway, uh, Drew is from Manhattan. Uh, he graduated from K-State. And him and his family now are in Topeka. They operate a nothing but cake store, so be sure to stop by and get some of those delicious cakes next time you're in Topeka. And say hi to Drew and his family. But uh, Drew is passionate about all types of cars. He's a car aficionado. He knows cars like nobody, but he has a real passion for the supercars, hypercars, and so the Ford GT is very dear to his heart, and you're going to find out why as he talks about it. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my friend Drew. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Drew, like Doug said, and I was a curator here for about two and a half years. So from January of 2018 to June of 2020, and then I, I helped acquire a lot of these cars. The museum has made some transitions and some different movement and layouts uh, since I've left and Doug has really been in charge of that and he's done a great job. Um, I was blessed with the opportunity to, to be the curator here uh, before the museum ever actually opened and uh, so it, it was a lot of fun and we, we got to drive the cars a little more often than once they're a little more stuck in place now that the museum is open. Um, but today I want to talk about what is the most foundational car in my experience at the museum and that is the Ford GT. And this car is foundational for three reasons um, and those three reasons are it was essential to me uh, acquiring the job in the first place, it was foundational or it was fundamental in my uh, learning to drive a manual vehicle and it was, it taught me the largest lesson which came from what was almost one of the largest failures of my life. So I will go ahead and talk through those stories. Um, now if you were wanting more information on the original Ford GT40 and the heritage and all of the racing tradition and, and Ferrari, um, Ferrari like uh, like this, this is a movie, Ford versus Ferrari. Uh, it's a very good movie. If you haven't seen it, I'm sure a lot of you have. Uh, it's an excellent Christian Bale, Matt Damon. Um, this is a really good video. Uh, I love these guys at Donut Media. They do a great job. Um, these guys are really good as well. And then Jay Leno's got a... a um, video on the GT also and let's see here so we will watch actually we'll watch that donut media video now it's only about 10 minutes long and it gives a much better job rather than me reciting a bunch of facts that I just copied off the internet uh, this morning so cats versus dogs good versus evil me versus Bart. These are some of the greatest rivalries of all time, but none of them hold a candle to the clash of titans that went down at Le Mans in the 1960s. From this meeting of giants came the greatest sports car the Ford Motor Company has ever produced. It's a motorsport legend that changed the way people perceived American cars around the world and put Ford at the top of the food chain. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Ford GT. Our story begins in 1963, Italy. Henry Ford II was in talks with Enzo Ferrari to buy the Ferrari brand and the deal was at the cusp of completion. Ford wanted to improve their image for performance because 
They didn't really have one. So instead of building a whole new car, Henry decided it would just be easier to buy up a struggling sports car brand from Europe. Luckily, at the time, Ferrari was a struggling car brand from Europe. But as Enzo was about to sign the contract selling his namesake to the Americans, he noticed a clause that he hadn't seen earlier. With the agreement, Ford would own the Ferrari. <laughs> I was choking on my spit. With the agreement, Ford would own both the Ferrari road car division and the race team. Enzo did not like that. Ferrari stormed out of the room with his lawyer in tow, leaving the Ford guys scratching their little noggins. Back home in Dearborn, Henry Ford II gathered his most trusted associates and gave them an order. Build a car that will crush Ferrari. To do that, the Ford Motor Company turned to British racing boutique the Lola company had competed in Le Mans before and used Ford small block V8s to do it. Knowing this, Ford offered to do a collab on their new race car. Kind of like Nelly and Tim McGraw. Ford's first car based on the Lola, the GT40 Mark I, didn't do so hot when they first took it to France in 1964. All three cars they took broke down. Clearly, Ford had some work to do. The man Ford hired to right the sinking ship was none other than Texan chicken farmer and American hero, Carol Shelby. My name's Carol Shelby and performance is my business. His Daytona coupe had won its class the same year all the Fords broke. So Henry figured that if there was anyone who could help beat Ferrari, it was him. Shelby and his team started tinkering with the GT40. They took the Mark I out to Willow Springs and measured air movement around the car. Shelby estimated the GT was losing 75 horsepower on airflow alone. So they went back to the shop and redesigned the inlets and outlets. They put some big old brakes on it so the car would stop faster for longer. Then Shelby did what Shelby did best. He turned the motor to make over 450 horsepowers. They took the GT to one of America's most hallowed endurance races. Racists. The 2,000 kilometers of Daytona. That's 1,242.74 miles for you freaking Yanks. No one knew how the Ford would do. Ferrari had won the previous year, and their car for the 1965 season was brand new. To beat Ferrari in Daytona would be a huge boost to morale. Kind of like pizza day here at Donut. Just pizza? No. Oh. Luckily for Shelby's team, the Ferrari blew a tire, letting the GT gain a huge lead and take the win. Not so luckily, the victory at Daytona would be the only win for the entire season. Even worse, Ferrari won at Le Mans that year. Again, Ferrari! In 1966, Henry Ford II is getting a little antsy in his little pantsies. They put so much time and money into these cars, but have nothing to show for it. Enzo Ferrari is chilling back at Marinello, laughing to himself every night before he goes to sleep. <laughs> Not this year, Henry thought to himself. They had to win. Shelby redesigned the GT again, this time with a Goliath 7 liter V8. The 427 was good for 485 horsepower. It was the same engine Ford was using in NASCAR. It was American as but Shelby wouldn't be the only guys racing for Ford. Since Henry was getting a little impatient, he brought in Holman Moody, the guys in charge of Ford's NASCAR program. Henry figured having two teams would create some competition and better his chances of beating Ferrari. And guess what? He was right. The two Ford teams fought hard all season and when they arrived at Le Mans, it was freaking on. Ford had to remind them, hey, you're here to beat Ferrari. Sell your differences on your own time. As the green flag dropped on race day, the GTs were off to a great start. And by 3 a.m. that morning, three of Shelby's cars were in the lead. And the Ferrari team had suffered serious damage on their most dominant cars. The hours and laps went by with each becoming more tense than the last. Could Ford finally win? At 4 p.m., two Shelbys and one Holman Moody crossed the finish line at Le Mans in a triangle formation. Ford had beat Ferrari. F 
I just almost started crying. <laughs> the GT would win three more races at Le Mans, cementing it as one of the greatest sports cars of all time. It proved that Americans could win at the racetrack, not just at the ovals, but at the most hallowed ground in all of European motorsport. It was kind of a big deal. Ford continued the GT program with the GT70, except this GT wasn't meant for Le Mans. It was designed for the dusty back roads of the World Rally Circuit. Ford UK wanted to beat Lancia and Porsche in the rally game like they had done in NASCAR and at Le Mans. But unlike those efforts, the GT70 didn't really work out and the project was scrapped in 1973. After that, Ford didn't really make any more sports cars. They made sporty cars like the Mustang and Escort, but nothing that captured that classic world beating Le Mans fight flavor of the GT40. But in 1995, Ford unveiled a new concept called the GT90. Ford took the chassis from the Jaguar XJ220 supercar and put a quad turbo V12 behind the driver. This insane power plant made the GT90 concept the fastest car in the world with a top speed of 253 miles an hour. In 1995, Coolio was still on the Billboard Hot 100 and this thing was putting up Bugatti Veyron numbers. But sadly, the GT90 90 was just one off concept car and never went into production. Ford fans would never see the GT name again until 2002. It had been nearly 60 years since Henry Ford II's deal with Ferrari fell through, and to commemorate Ford's crowning achievement, they introduced their GT40 concept car to the world at the Detroit Auto Show. And unlike the GT90 before it, this GT actually made it to production in 2004. The GT made 550 horsepower from a 5.4 liter supercharged V8. <laughs> Some people think the engine is the same as the Ford Lightnings, but the GT's was all aluminum, had more valves, dual fuel injectors, a dry sump system, and piston skirt oil squirters. The GT40 was in production from 2004 to 2006, and in that short time, it reminded the world that Ford could make a stellar supercar. But it would be 10 more years until the GT returned to Le Mans. In January 2015, Mariah Carey was single again. Shia LaBeouf was in that Sia video, and most importantly, Ford shocked the world yet another time with the reveal of the 2016 Ford GT at the Detroit Auto Show. People lost their friggin' minds. It's the coolest car I have ever seen, and I saw the Wienermobile twice. The new GT is powered by a twin turbo EcoBoost V6 this time around, making 647 horsepower. The car is almost entirely carbon fiber, weighing in at just over 3,000 pounds, only twice as much as my dad. Buttresses are sculpted into the sides of the body, reducing drag and guiding air to the rear wing. That wing deploys at high speeds to keep the tail in check and flattens when you step on the brakes to slow the car down. If you want to take your GT to the track, you don't have to worry about installing a cage because it already has a cage. This thing is a real race car for the road. I've driven one. I drove it before the Stig did. You know, we both, we have a lot in common because we're both professional drivers. The race version of the GT differed from the street one in a few key ways. Front splitter, rear diffuser, a fixed wing, and exhaust outlets inside the taillights. Sick. It was no coincidence that Ford chose 2016 as the launch year of the GT. It would be the 50th anniversary since their victory over Ferrari at Le Mans, and Ford wanted to go back and win again. That would be pretty sweet, but other people like winning too. Ford rivals Chevy and Ferrari weren't going to let Old Blue take the win just because it was his anniversary. If Ford wanted the checkered flag, they were going to have to work for it. The weight of the Ford's name was on this team's shoulders. Miraculously, two American GTs locked out the front row in qualifying with Ferrari close behind in third. The stage was set for war! With heavy rain pouring on the track, the 2016 24 hours of of Le Mans started behind the safety car. After the start, Ford traded the lead with Ferrari all day, battling mechanical issues and other cars along the way. At certain points, it looked like Ford wouldn't be grasping at victory that day. But then, 
With four and a half hours left, the number 68 GT pulled off a pass on the leading Ferrari down the Molson Strait. A few laps later, the Ferrari spun, giving the Ford plenty of breathing room. All they had to do was hold on to the end. Then, as the checkered flag waved, the number 68 crossed the finish line, securing the LM GT Pro Class victory. Ford had won Le Mans. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> I started crying. It's such a good story. So subscribe to Donut Media so you never have to miss an episode of Up to Speed. This car's got two turbos. Want to know how they work? Check out this episode of Science Garage. Uh, you want to see a better video than that? Check out this Up to Speed on the Eclipse. If you want a shirt, go to shop.donut.media. Follow me on Instagram at James Pumphrey. Follow Donut on Instagram at Donut Media. I love you. The first reason um, that this car was so fundamental to me was in early 2018 or the end of 2017 I was a, I was downtown near the mall with my dad and we had taken or he had taken a picture of this Lamborghini Palm Beach truck which we happened to see which you do not see every day in Manhattan Kansas so I sent a picture of it to my mom and I said is this Ward's new car because she had worked for the ward at the time at Civic Plus and really um, spent a lot of time with him and said he was, he was acquiring a bunch of new cars. And, and uh, so I asked if, if it was his and she responded and said it was his car, but it was not a Lamborghini. Uh, it was actually a 2006 Ford GT, um, which is a pretty awesome car regardless. Um, and so she had mentioned to him about my passion for cars and he had said I should just send him an email uh, kind of explaining how I would want to work for him or, or maybe in the summer get a position um, as he was planning to amass a large collection. So I sent him an email and just said what an honor it would be to work for him and attach my resume to it. And I heard back right away once 2018 had started and he said that he was actually in Arizona at the time and he wanted someone who could research these cars for him because he happened to be at the yearly car auctions that are in that Scottsdale area. And so he wanted me to kind of review uh, different options and make sure he was getting the best examples of each car that was on his acquisition list. So I put together some matrices of different vehicles either at that time or in that area so that he knew he was getting the right car for the right price and we were, we were just kind of discussing color options and different spec layouts and that type of thing. Um, so after a few successful purchases, Ward said he wanted someone to put together a drop box for him so that we could have each of these vehicles in their own respective car folders. And I went ahead and did that and we had uh, each car had their own folder online and that way we could more neatly organize the collection and that led to him needing a curator as his plan turned into uh, he wanted to open a museum for the public to come and view which we have today so it was uh, it was a position that he needed as a, a curator and I was happy to take that on as I finished up my last few hours at uh, K-State um, and graduated with a degree in accounting so that's the first reason that that car is so foundational in my experience. Now the second reason is because about April or May uh, rolled around and it became apparent that I needed to learn how to drive a stick shift or a manual vehicle. So I practice started off with uh, the museum's 1973 um, Volkswagen thing, which this one and it was uh it was with sarah the icon investment coo at the time and 
As soon as she had signed off on my ability to drive a stick, or at least not stall that particular vehicle, we had enough of those plaid seats, and she turned to me and she said, let's try the GT now. So I was uh, pretty nervous. I acted very confident as I gently towed the very famously docile clutch of the 2006 Ford GT and shifted from first gear to second gear. Uh, the, the aluminum grommet holes in the seats and the supercharger right behind your head and that V8 with 550 horsepower. Um, sitting behind the wheel of a quarter million dollar supercar was nerve wracking to say the least and uh, I was I had a good time the toggle switches only add to that experience very nostalgic almost like you're still in the 1960s um, and one important thing about this car is that many large car collection owners to this day say that this is well some say that this is their favorite car amongst all the different cars that are available at the moment uh, because it's just such a such a fun driving experience and obviously the the manual shifting adds to that and um, It's just high praise from everyone, which is really great um, Even being somewhat dated at this point So that is uh, the entire story of how I went from driving a 1973 Volkswagen to driving one of the most famous and rare vehicles in the world in a span of about eight hours. <laughs> and now the third story I like to tell about this car. Um, this is the important, almost largest failure of my life. Um, it was probably mid 2018 at this point and I knew that the application for these new Ford GTs were going to be due in the coming months. So I made sure to get ahead of schedule, get everything prepared, and I believe there was a whole list of things that you needed to have um, in order to acquire a vehicle. You needed to do like Ford vehicle cars that you owned, uh, car related charitable activities, public influence or collection, um, and then you also needed to submit a one minute video. And I can show you that. We won't have sound for that one. And obviously, you wouldn't be able to hear him, but he basically just says, My name is Ward Morgan, and uh, I'd be interested in getting a 2000, at that time we were thinking it was going to be a 19 Ford GT. Um, I really would enjoy driving the car when we have it, and when I'm not driving it, it'd be on display in our collection at the Midwest Dream Car Collection um, for the public to come and view, and it wouldn't just be us viewing it but it would also be featured on outside personalities coming in to review our cars uh, so I inserted some footage of this was Hoovy's garage he and I shot a few videos together in the 4 GT and uh, and that was most of the video um, but he ended it saying he really liked the look of the 2006 model and was really excited for what was to come in the next iteration. So I was fully prepared to submit all of this that we had and uh, until the fateful day, I was riding back in the museum's pickup truck with the mechanic, Nick, and I saw a post on Instagram that said that something about the final applications for the Ford GT, the new Ford GT was going to be closed or, or they were closed at that point. And uh, so after my cortisol levels spiked 
and my stomach dropped to the depths of hell. I knew that I was not going to be in good terms with anyone. Um, and one important caveat is that, well, first, this is the, one of the most sought after vehicles in the world. And this was my one chance to acquire the vehicle. Um, and it had come and gone without me ever even knowing it. So the one caveat about this is that at that time, those cars, you could buy them for roughly $500,000 and they were selling for about $1.5 million. And some simple math would tell you that that is a million dollar profit that I had just lost down the drain. And um, so I spilled the beans to Sarah at Icon Investments and she said I needed to own up to my mistake with Ward. And so I, I think I sent him an email or call them or something. Um, but he invited me to breakfast in the following few days. And it, it's a breakfast that I surely will not forget because I was so nervous going to it. And um, he basically told me a story about some guy at a company, I, I think it was at Microsoft. I, and it's a pretty famous story, so you might have heard it. But this guy had lost the company a million dollars or something, let's say. And they refused to fire him though because they had just invested that amount of money into his skill set. And um, Ward said he wouldn't give me that same speech and he made sure to convey a sense of disappointment. And uh, I was pretty nervous when I left that day as well. Um, but at that point I had adopted the extreme ownership mentality and uh, I decided I'm gonna send everything I have or find an email address and send everything I have regardless, um, just on the chance that we could get something to happen. So I had seen a Shmi 150 YouTube video and it, he basically was, he has a 4GT. He was saying that the director of the 4GT at that time was Henry Ford III um, so I found an email address for Henry Ford III, sent him everything that I had in regards to the GT and application, and I had found an online thing that just basically described every, I think it was called every question on the 4GT application. So I just sent it thinking, you know, maybe there's an off chance I'll hear something. I didn't hear anything for probably three months, and one day I got a call from Detroit, Michigan, and it was the real director of the 4GT division. And he said that this application had come across his desk and he was pretty interested in what we had. So he wanted to see if he could send me an email with a link and I could fill out an official application online. That way they could add it into the pile that they already had. And after my immediate yes, I believe I had that application filled out in 47 seconds, <laughs> give or take. I'm not sure that anyone was counting. Um, but then we, uh, we received an email a few months after that too, that said we had been uh, approved for acquiring the new GT. And obviously it's here today. So. That was pretty great. Um, then we got sent a spec box, which is this, and it's pretty awesome because you could, it came with all these little manual tiles and uh, different color options you could choose. You could switch out the different stripe colors and vehicle colors and then do interior leather colors and um, wheel options with brake calipers and um, we went through a bunch of different options I believe I think we emailed them all back and forth several times and we could have done something like all carbon fiber would have been pretty great um, the I think this was like a really rare color I'm not sure you could actually get but I think that's a very cool car uh, or we were gonna do just like a K-State purple um, but then Ward went ahead and decided 
he would choose the most boring color option he could. <laughs> he claims that it was meant to match the 2006 model that we have, and I have to admit that was probably not the worst idea. Um, it's, it is a pretty good match, and uh, I like I like the idea behind that, but he did add some pretty sweet graphics to the side with those 82 logos and the 4GT logos, and uh, it's, a, it's a good looking car. Once we received the car, I got a chance to drive it uh, this summer um, while Ward had it at his house and after it had been um, protection film covered and everything. And here's a few specs on the engine. So the 2006 is on the left side here. Um, it's a supercharged V8, 550 horsepower, and uh, it's a rear wheel drive with a six speed manual transmission, whereas the 2022 model is a twin turbo V6, and it's a, an EcoBoost engine, which is similar to a lot of Ford vehicles or pickup trucks, F-150s you see today, uh, but obviously it is tuned to be a little more high performance than that and uh, it's rear wheel drive but it's got a dual clutch automatic instead of that manual which is would have been good for me um, had it still been early 2018 but um, so that in conclusion is a few of my favorite stories that i enjoy telling about the ford gt and uh and all that I've learned from that 4GT and I hope that you too learned a few things so that you won't also forget a deadline or um, lose a million dollars in the process. <laughs> so, but do please do go to those resources if you're interested. Here's a few more photos of the car that I took this summer. This is cool because it's the flying buttress is what they call that um, just out the side mirror. The flying buttress is like uh, that little space in between the, I think the radiators and the, the actual body of the car, um, which most cars don't have, and that's pretty cool. Um, here was a few uh, others that I took. But like I said, please do go to those other resources um, I showed at the beginning. If you want to learn more about the history of the Ferrari and Ford competition and everything, I want to thank you all for coming. I hope that was entertaining. And uh, those are just some of my favorite stories about the car. So thank you. Do you have any questions for Drew? Uh, 1982, as yeah. I recall, I had an 82 Ford uh, Mustang GT 302, and it was only 150 horsepower. It was a low point of performance. So what's the significance of 82 on this car? Ward, Ward told me that he graduated high school in 1982, oh, okay. and that's why he chose that. I asked him that this summer. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm assuming Ward's forgiven you for your mistake. I think he has, yeah. I think he actually really enjoys telling that story. Here <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yes. So what did he say when you called him and told him you acquired the car? Uh, well, I, I don't remember actually. Um, I don't remember if I emailed him or... I know I remember talking to Lynn and Sarah, and Lynn was the museum director at that time. I had gotten the email when I was back in the office and we had just opened or just moved into the museum, this location. Um, before then we were at several different locations keeping the cars in storage and that type of thing. Um, but I remember walking out to Sarah and Lynn at the time and told her that we got the car and they were elated. They were just full of joy. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I'm not sure if Ward was in the state at that time, but somehow he found out, and I'm sure he was excited too. So, yes. You mentioned the markup on a car. Aren't there some restrictions when you buy one, though? There are, yes, actually. Are so the um, I don't think you can you can't sell the car for two years minimum, which is interesting. They didn't want people to just 
flip them for a profit right away, right when they got the car. That's why you have the two year restriction on selling them. So, and I think there was a few people that had sold them ahead of the two years, uh, just at the time. And I'm sure they got in trouble somehow, but I don't remember what the, what the deal was exactly. But yeah, we, we still can't sell this one for, for a while, or I shouldn't say we, I'm not here anymore, but, um, <laughs> but Ward couldn't sell this one for a while if he wanted to. So. Thank you, Drew. He says he's not still here anymore, but that's not true because Drew still serves on our collection advisory board. We meet monthly, and so Drew still has, has a finger in the cars that we select here at the museum. does an awesome job. But anyway, I'm going to talk him into hopping in this and starting it up. I think people would like to hear it. Push the car, Jim. Yeah, if you go flying through the wall, it's going to call the warden in after that. I'm not going to. It's pretty throaty. Yeah, Thank you, Drew. Awesome presentation. 